Our Father, we pray that you open our eyes of understanding now. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. As I said, it's part of the series on church growth. And it's important that we talk about the church and we talk about growth before we look at our part, our role or function in church growth. Looking at the way Jesus himself used the word, you will see what the church means in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. But I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Here Jesus Christ said, he will build the church. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Here we find a use of the word saved in connection with those who are coming into the membership of the church. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 22. Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You see a lot of things over here that we're not going to wait to explain. Or to illustrate but it mentions the church it mentions disciples it mentions christians immediately as we connect all these things it means people believe on the lord they become saved they become disciples and followers of christ they are called christians and they aggregate the congregation the assembly of such Saved followers of Christ are called the church. And then in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Take it, to your, take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased, with his own blood. Over here we are told the church is a redeemed community. Saved, redeemed, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Ghost appoints ministers over them to feed them. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Here we are told, of the original design, the purpose, the plan of God for the church to make it glorious, to purify it, and to make it to be without blood, without blemish, without wrinkle. Put everything together. It means that as the term is used, it describes local groups of believers. The church then is the assembly of redeemed people People who have repented, people who have been forgiven, people who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ 
with saving faith. And they have been redeemed or saved from their sins. And the reason why we're here is that we have part in the work of the church. Then this uh, conference, the act or the ministry of evangelism and church growth. And as we talk about evangelism and church growth, and since the series of talks I'll be giving you will be talking much on how the church will grow. We need to talk about growth a little. What do we mean by growth? Again, over here, let's refer to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say concerning growth. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter is servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 5, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we talk about growth, we'll be talking on the growth of believers and the churches, communities of believers in faith, growing in knowledge, growing in Christian spiritual characteristics. When we're talking about growth, we're not only talking about numerical growth. We'll be addressing issues here at the conference that will help you to know that your church can grow until, by the grace of God, the whole church will come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Again, we'll be talking about how the church will grow in the grace of God. And that has a lot of spiritual consequence. When members in the church know the grace of God, receive the grace of God, and they grow in the grace of God and in the knowledge of the Lord. In um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Looking at it from verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. When we talk about church growth, we're talking about the faith of the members of the church growing exceedingly, and they also growing and abounding in love in acts chapter 9 acts chapter 9 verse 31 then are the churches rest throughout all judea and galilee and samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy ghost were multiplied. There is also numerical growth. And I believe that the prayer of Moses for the children of Israel should be our prayer today as we think about the numerical growth of the church. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. Deuteronomy chapter 1 Verses 10 and 11. The Lord your God has multiplied you. And behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are. And bless you as he has promised you. 
That's the prayer that Moses prayed for Israel. And I believe that it's the desire of the Lord. Not only his desire, it's design that the church will be multiplied. And that even though you might have been large now, I believe that as the Lord will open our eyes and we see the vision of the Almighty God and we receive mighty anointing from the Lord, I believe that whatever growth you have seen, the Lord is promising he'll make us a, a thousand times many more than we are at present. I believe the Lord will do it. So then, from all that I've read to you, you will see that as we refer to growth, the Bible talks about the growth of the church as the growth of the body of Christ, growing to the fullness of the stature of Christ, growing in knowledge, growing in faith, growing in love, growing in holiness and spiritual characteristics, growing in fruit-bearing and reproductive ability, and consequently growing in number. It is this kind of growth spiritual, physical, numerical, that we'll be addressing ourselves to in the series that I've spoken about on fishing, farming, building, parenting, and shepherding. In this message, I want to look into what the Bible has to say concerning fishing. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 and he said unto them follow me and i will make you fishers of men there is frequent allusion to the art of fishing in the bible both in the old testament and the new testament the first pictorial language that jesus used in connection with evangelism and in connection with church growth relates to fishing that's what i just read to you now that was his first pictorial language that relates to catching men for the kingdom of god influencing men to decide in the right direction of believing on the lord and being saved and preparing them for eternal fellowship with God. If you think about it very well, the first disciples he called were previously fishermen. Not only that, all the disciples in the inner circle were fishermen. Not only that, the first miracle which Peter personally experienced, symbolic of what would later happen to him in his ministry after Pentecost, related to the miraculous catch of fish. Then we have a lot to learn from the biblical and contemporary art of fishing that will help us in our task of evangelizing the world and helping the church to grow. Fishing is one of the oldest and most important activities of man. As I've told you, some of the disciples of Jesus were fishermen. In fact, seven out of twelve were fishermen. And so, that profession provided for them a springboard through which they can learn a lot of lessons for their evangelism and church growth. And no doubt, they understood when Jesus used fishing as a metaphor for their evangelistic mission. What do you think they would have understood? What do we learn today? What can we learn from what Jesus said about their fishing? Let's look at these one by one. Number one, when Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men, he was likening the men to fish and the world to the sea or to the river. And immediately what strikes you there is that the river is never possessed by any fisherman nobody can say that river is mine nobody can go to that area which means that jesus christ expects that if you're a minister of the gospel the sea is so deep the sea is so wide 
which means the world is so, is so wide that you can go to any part of the world and fish and catch people and bring them into the kingdom of God. There are many, sh there are many spots at the shore where each one can start fishing. And at present, you know, all over the world now, from what we have seen, there are more than 5 million people in the world that are making fishing their profession. Therefore, there is room for everyone. You cannot say, we have a lot of ministers already. Therefore, nobody can have the call of God anymore. When we're many enough. We're doing the work of the Lord. If you say you are getting the call of God now and you are going to fish, where are you going to fish? Because this river is mine. That river belongs to uh, Reverend so-and-so. That river belongs to Bishop so-and-so. The rivers are available for everybody. And you can take your net and your hook and your material and your tools and go to any spot where there are no fishermen at present and you can begin to fish. Another thing we learn from the pictorial language Jesus used is that there are different types of rivers and seas that require the use of different kinds of boats, ships, instruments, and, and tools. Many times people do not realize. They just say, well, they're fishing in that area. I want to fish in this area. Now, the place where the other person may be fishing may be very, very deep, may be in the ocean. And therefore, he needs a big ship, and he needs a lot of crew, and needs a lot of instrument. But maybe you are fishing in a neighboring uh, river that is not so deep, and you are still trying. We say, preacher, or pastor, or evangelist, why are you not, uh, you know, preaching now? Oh, you know, I'm waiting for a big boat. I need a van. I need instruments. I need PA system. I need an interpreter. Oh, we say, what's the matter with you? The people you are talking to, the people you are going to preach to, don't you know their language? Oh, yes, I know their language. Can't you speak in that language? I can speak in that language. But you know, I met an evangelist, uh, so and, such and such, and he has an interpreter. I must have an interpreter. And you know also, he has PA system. How many people is he addressing? Well, when I attended this crusade, they had about, uh, you know, 10,000, 20,000. And uh, I looked at the make of his uh, microphone and loudspeaker system. That's what I'm trying to get before I start preaching. How many people in your congregation you want to preach to? Well, I thank God, uh, you know, we just started not long ago. I have about 25 with me now. And you are looking for PA system, you are looking for van. Let us understand the seas and the rivers are different. Therefore, the boats and the instruments that we need to use will be different. We do not need to wait until we have all the instruments of all the other preachers before we start. You get instrument that is uh, appropriate for your own river, for your own sea, and start fishing and do not waste time. Therefore, it means strategies will be different. We cannot import strategy from one location to the other because the rivers are different. The fish, they are different. And therefore, we will only apply the strategy or the method that will work in our own locality. We do not honestly need costly million dollar equipment. You know, sometimes because of what we have seen, other ministries do. Uh, they've got, you know, this uh, million dollar plan and they are trying to raise this offering and raise that offering. We feel that if we don't have that, we cannot start work. No, you can start work. Uh, fishermen do not all use the same tool. Some of us will have to be using our hook. Some of us will be using the line. Some of us, a big net. Some of us may be using the spear. You use different tools. Don't wait until you have what every other person has before you start the work. Another thing we learn is that there are different types of fish. And there are different types of people too. Modern science has classified 22,000 species of fish. Each having its distinctive size or shape. It's some peculiar location 
or way of living. That means then, all these various uh, kinds of fish will need different kinds of approaches. And if you think about it very well, the method that gets or catches an old man that is very near the grave may not catch a teenager who wants to enjoy the world before he comes to Christ. If you think about it very well, the method that catches a person that is having job and is, uh, you know, settled and he has everything that his family needs, the method he uses in getting him to know Christ may not catch the people that are jobless, that do not know where the food will come from tomorrow. Not only that, the method that will catch your illustration and the kind of message of preaching that will catch a villager who has never even gone to the state capital of your state. The kind of preaching that will catch him may not catch somebody in the city who is all the time watching television, who knows about America, knows about Japan, knows about all the politics and change of government all over the world. The method that will catch a simple-minded villager may not catch a person in the city. Different, a different fish and different method. Different people and different approaches. The mistake we make many times is that maybe we had an effective message. That when we preached it in a particular community, maybe those communi that community is a community of idol worshippers. And you demonstrated and you talked about the impotence of idols and all the evil things they're doing. And then you challenged them and they came to the Lord. They smashed all their idols and it was a great, great message. And you say, I've got, uh, you know, the message that will win the whole world to the Lord. And then uh, maybe you have opportunity of uh, coming to the city or opportunity of going to university to go and preach to some of these uh, college people. And then you brought out your message out of the file. And you looked at it, you say, huh, this is my sword, there is nothing like it. And I will win everybody by this single message. And then these people that you are talking to, some of them, They've come from, you know, a kind of society where they have never seen what you call idol. They know the vocabulary, but they have never seen the villagers bowing down. They have been all their life in the city. And then you come, and everything you were saying in that village that made everybody to come forward and receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you began your illustration, and you demonstrated, and you painted it, and you preached everything. And while you were talking, the college students were pinching one another, saying, this rural village man, what's he talking about? And then after you finish uh, your message, uh, you say, now if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you didn't touch their lives. You didn't scratch them where they are itching. You didn't talk about the thing that will pin them down and arrest their attention and bring them to the Lord. The mistake you make is that if we have been fishing with a hook in a village river, we can take um, you know, that same hook to the great ocean of the world and use uh, you know, that same hook. The wind and the wave and the storm will carry away all your line. If you are not careful, it will carry you away yourself. That means when you look at the kind of fish and at the kind of river, your methods will change. You will adapt what you are doing to the people that you are preaching to. We have been told by people that have studied fishing uh, in contemporary times that different tools are used. Some use huge nets. Some use spears. Some use traps. Some use long lines with dozens of hooks hung at different spots of the line. Some use fly reels. Some use dredging and other methods. All these different methods are necessary to be able to catch the different uh, fish and in the different uh, seas. We must then be careful to understand the appropriate method to be employed. And in our seminars, and workshops, we'll be talking about methods. We'll be talking about what do you do in this uh, community? What do you do at this time? And also, we'll be having question time. That whatever we have not covered in the main messages on evangelism and church growth, you are free to ask and tell us uh, you are ministering in this part of the country. This is the kind of uh, difficulty you are having or the kind of response you are having. And you want to know what more you can do. 
will be able to call on other people that have experienced the same thing you are talking about. And by the grace of God, we'll be able to learn together and we'll be able to grow together in Jesus' name. Some nets of evangelism will only catch fish living in shallow waters very close to the shore. Some nets will not catch fish that are hundreds of uh, feet deep underneath the sea. They can only catch the fish very near the shore. You see, when you look at people, they are not all close to the gospel. Some people already have awareness of the gospel. Some people already have conviction about the gospel. Some people have been meditating on the challenge of the gospel. Although they have not totally given in, they are very near the shore. And there is a kind of net, a kind of effort that can reach out because it's very near the shore. He has said before, only he has not decided. He has been confronted before by the message of Christ and the truth of the gospel. Very near the shore, you can easily get at him if you know where he is. But you know many times some of us do not even check up. Where is this man? Is he aware of the gospel? Has he been convicted by the truth of the gospel? Has he been encountered by four by the challenge of the gospel if we know that he has been encountered before then it's very near the shore and there is a way we can catch such an individual but then there are some other people like fish very down deep under the sea they've never had any inclination any good information in fact they are totally negative now you tell me if the fish is more than a hundred feet deep down under the sea and then your net is only about 10 feet long you throw it it will never reach the fish you are trying to catch let us know that some people are so far away from the gospel so deep underneath the water of custom and tradition and religion and evil and sin and the contemporary times and customs that if you do not have the appropriate net you will not be able to catch them. And so, these fish that inhabit the depths of the sea, far from the shore, will have to be caught by great nets. That's why Paul the Apostle said he adapts his method to the people that he was preaching to because he knew that they are not all at the same place, very close to the shore. Some are close, some are far. And you need to adapt your method to reach the people you are trying to bring to the Lord. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. From verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet I made, have, have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more unto the Jew. I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jew. What did he mean by this? Anytime he went to the Jews, he talked about, I'm a Jew, a Pharisee of the tribe of Benjamin. And then he will say, it's in the, it's in the face of our fathers. And then he will quote the Old Testament scriptures, and then they will try to get them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. It didn't mean that he will compromise, but that he will adapt his method, his approach, his strategy to catching the people. And then in verse 21, to them that are without law, as without law. Have you noticed when he came to Athens? Instead of quoting from the Old Testament, because these people did not know the Old Testament prophets, but they knew the gentle poets. Then he quoted from the poets, he said, as some of your poets say. And then after saying what they said, he now applied it that you have been worshipping an unknown God. That God you do not know, you see, he could not talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They didn't know him. He couldn't talk about all the writings of the Old Testament. They didn't know all that. He approached them at the level where he saw them. 
And that is what the Lord is teaching us, that if we're going to fish aright, we will need to adapt our method to the people we are uh, evangelizing or bringing to the Lord. Verse 21 again, to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. Verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. Now, how do we approach children? How do we bring them to the Lord? Obviously, there are ways we can talk about children being weak because they are not adults. How do we approach women? The Bible talks about women being the weaker vessel. You get to a particular church and you find that all the, most of the members in that church will be men. They do not have an approach that can catch the weaker vessels that can catch the women and bring them to the Lord. On the other hand, you come to a particular church, you find that most of the members there are women. They are well adapted to talking in the language of those women, reasoning with the reasoning faculty of those women, approaching them in a way that is so suitable to them, meeting their felt needs. And therefore, you find the women are there. But on the other hand, you find that in that same church where you have a lot of women, you don't have men, men that are educated and sharp, men that could be very argumentative, men that could even try to confuse you, the preacher. You do not have a way of reaching out to them. But Paul the Apostle said, when I get in the midst of the barbarians who don't understand Greek language, I talk to them in their language. And I know how to read them because I'm a debtor to the barbarians. When I get to the Greeks who are the philosophers of the day, I'm at home with them. I reach out to them because I am called to reach out to the Greeks. And when I get to the Jews, of course, I'm in their midst because I was a Pharisee myself. And being a Jew, I know how to approach them. What we're learning here is that if you are really going to fish, successfully adapt yourself to the conditions of the people in your message and what you're doing. Another thing we learn from this uh, language of Jesus Christ is that familiarity with the tides and the waves of the particular sea where you are fishing is very, very advantageous. Because, you see, there are seasons when the waves will beat to the shore. And every scene at the shore, if you do not anchor that boat at the shore, and if you yourself you are not very careful to maintain a place and a stand, a position of security, the wave will come and take you away. But people who have studied the fishing, they tell us, I mean the experts, they tell us that a fisherman can smell the wave hundreds of yards or meters before it gets to him and because he's so experienced he will tell you trouble is coming and he'll begin to already get ready if it is something that he knows he can weather the storm and if the boat is strong enough all that he has is strong enough he'll stay there and get ready if he knows it is something that will carry him away before that wave gets to that place he would have got to the shore but you know if you are not experienced you just get to a particular uh, sea and you are fishing and the wave is coming you cannot smell it you cannot sense it you cannot see that the wave is coming that danger is coming it's when it gets about 10 feet from where you are you say ah look at what is coming at the time you see there's no remedy again there's nothing you can do how do we apply that to evangelism there are people that will say i have the call of god you know sometimes there is somebody who might you know have been in a town like this in a major city he doesn't know the idolatry in the village he doesn't know the witchcraft in the village he doesn't know all the terrible things that go on in the village over here he says i have the call of god i have the call of god and we'll say thank god for it we need more preachers and then where is the call of god taking is taking me to the village the rural areas i'm going right there 
uh, have you been there before? Have you lived in the village before? Do you know any say, oh no, the Spirit of God is with me. I have knowledge of the Bible. How do you talk to illiterates uh, who cannot read the Bible? Well, I don't worry about that. When I get there, every problem will solve itself. And then he gets to the place and he says he's looking for accommodation. And they give him accommodation. He finds a place that has been abandoned because of the spirit of the ancestors that drove everybody out there. And nobody will rent the place. And this man that is a city man is coming from the city. He didn't know any right from left. And he says he's looking for accommodation. They say, from where are you? He mentions the town. Have you been in a village like this before? No, not at all. But you know, I have a great mission. I have a great call. All right, we have a place uh, that nobody will rent. Uh, will you take the place anywhere? Anywhere. Then they show him the place. They say, that's your house. And in the night, some things are running, uh, you know, in the ceiling. He's not able to sleep. And uh, while trying to sleep, some things press him down on the bed. And then he jumps up, he takes his, you know, light and goes around and looks around. And he didn't see anything. And he tried to sleep again. And it's all trouble. The mistake he's making is that he didn't find out before he went. But a person who is seasoned fisherman will know that the waves are coming. And before the waves come, he'll get ready. A person like that will need to understand what it means to deal with evil spirits, what it means to deal with occultism, what it means to deal with the forces that will discourage you and destroy the work you're doing. If uh, you do not know how the waves will come and might uh, pose a real trouble to you, before you know what is happening, that's why we find that somebody said he was, you know, called to be a preacher, but now you know he has backsliding. Or something has happened, his family has been scattered. Because some of these people do not know that there are some things that will militate against, sometimes against their family, sometimes against their personality. Sometimes depression will come, he will not know where the depression is coming from. He will not know that the community in which he's fishing has a lot of uh, ways that he needs to understand and handle. And in the uh, seminars and workshops, we'll be talking about some of these areas. Look at the program very well. You'll be able to choose if that is your situation. You'll be able to see how to handle such situation. That means that we must carefully understand each group of community or people. If we are to effectively do our mission work of catching people for Christ, we must understand people in terms of their distinctive customs, in terms of their thought pattern. You know, there are ways in which people think, and uh, you may be surprised that people think differently, and their system of thinking or their thought pattern will affect the way they shift your message. You are the preacher, you are giving them a message, the source of the message you are getting from above. But there's a channel, and when it gets to your target audience, they are going to sift it, not in the way you understand things, but in the way they understand things. Therefore, you need to understand their culture, even though a bit of their history, and know their social structures so that you'll be able to help in determining the method of evangelism that will be effective on them. Another thing is that we should learn from the experience of other successful fishermen in the area so that we can have an access to the people. Many times there are people that just come into a community. They do not go to the ministers that have been there before them. They say, well, um, I'm called, and I do not want any association with any minister, but my French minister, some of these other ministers have experience. They know the customs of the land. They know the situations of the land. They, know, they have gathered experience in the work they have done in that community. And if you are going to work in the same community, easily you can go to them and say, well, I'm a fellow minister. You have fellowship with them, and then they are able to direct you. They are able to tell you that this is how we have been doing the work here. This is the difficulty we have. These are the problems we face. And this is how we solve this kind of problem whenever it comes. It helps us to learn from experienced fishermen who have been at the shore, who have been at that river before we got there. In Proverbs chapter 9. 
Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Even though we know the Lord, there is no harm in learning from other people. Now, as I close, I want to read to you and bring some lessons out on this fishing from Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm reading to you from verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two sheaves standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were, and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the sheaves, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he, and he sat down and taught the people out of the sheep. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other sheep, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. As you look at this story, remember that Jesus Christ told the disciples, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. That is, the experience you have got in fishing will be transferred to your spiritual ministry. And what you have learned in your fishing business or trade, you will apply in your ministry for the gospel of the kingdom of God. Very briefly then, what do we notice in the story that I've just read to you? Five things I want you to think about in this story. Number one, failure. Number two, faith. Number three, faithfulness. Number four, fishing. Number five, fruitfulness. Number one is failure. You have seen in the story that I read to you that Peter and the rest of the, of the fishermen here, they failed. And don't let that surprise you. You might have failed before, but understand the last chapter of the history of your life has not been written. You see, when you were at school, you failed a lot of times. You might fail in a particular test. That doesn't mean that you are a failure. You will say, I failed that test, but I'm not a failure. Many people, what discourages them is that maybe in a particular evangelistic outreach, they failed. That's all right. Every one of us will fail once in a while. Who oh, you say never. Yes, that's the real thing. You see, when you, are going, when you go to school, if you are still going to school or if you have gone to school before, you will realize that in, uh, when you were in primary one, you didn't pass every test. There were weekends where you brought your card, when you brought your card home and you had tears on your face. And daddy or mommy said, what's the matter with you? And you said, I got nothing. I failed. With encouragement, you did your assignment. Eventually, you passed out of school. We may have temporary failure. That doesn't mean that failure is the central thing, the total thing, the final thing that is written about our lives. Peter failed. But then, let's examine the fact why he failed. Well, from what we have read, he toiled all the night. It's difficult toiling without the light from above. There are many ministers of the gospel. The, reason, the single reason we can give for their failure is that they are toiling 
without light from above. In the night, you may have artificial light. You may have your torch light, or you may have your candle, or you may have another kind of artificial light. But in this work of the kingdom that God has called us into, the artificial light of your intelligence will not help you to succeed. The artificial light of your skill will not help you to succeed. The artificial light that you may have and say, I have this light of natural knowledge. You know, there are some people that have the knowledge of, uh, you know, the community. They have knowledge of this and that. But that is not enough. We need Christ, the light of the world. And when you toil without the light, you may record failure most of the time. Not only that, they had not met the Lord. They toiled without Christ. You'll be surprised how many people are trying to preach the gospel. And they toil in their fishing business, in their trying to evangelize. They do not know Christ. They do not know Christ as Savior. They do not know Christ as Sanctifier. They do not know Christ as the Baptizer in the Holy Ghost. They do not know Christ as a king of kings. And they do not know Christ as the captain of our salvation. They do not know Christ as a chief cornerstone. They do not know Christ as the only begotten of the Father. They do not know Christ uh, as the person in whom all authority and power dwells. And because they do not have the full knowledge of Christ... And they are trying to toil without the captain. They are trying to toil without the king of kings. They are trying to toil without the one that has authority in heaven and on earth. They fail. A little difficulty, they fail. A little problem, they fail. And even in the methods that they are trying to use, they do not know Christ as the wisdom of God. And because they are toiling without the light, Toiling in the night with all the artificial light they have got, without Christ, they fail. There are people that are just nominal Christians. They call themselves Christians. They're not born again. They do not know the Lord. They have never repented of their sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in a very definite way, in an act of surrendering, giving themselves unto the Lord. They are strangers to Christ. They have not known him. They might have read about him. They might have known some of his history. They might have known some things, some facts about Christ. But the real experiential knowledge about Christ as Savior, they do not have. And yet they are in the ministry. What should they do? Should we tell them, get out of the ministry? That may not be the answer. The answer is know Christ. And I pray that we will know Christ in this conference. And if you have known Christ already, you will know him more. You will know him deeply. And you will have a deeper, richer relationship and fellowship with the Lord in Jesus' name. They toiled with acquired skill. You see, there are many people that have acquired some skill at the seminary. They have acquired some skill in the college, in the theological college. And then they come to say, now I want to fish. But let me ask you, suppose there is, a, you know, a school where you learn about all the rivers of the world, all the fish of the world, all the hooks in the world, all the geographical locations where you have all the rivers and the seas, and then you take a course on the geography of all the seas of the world and you take an exam and they tested you on how many major rivers and seas and oceans and lagoons do we have in nigeria in ghana in west africa and you have you went into the library you've never been actually to the lagoon you've never been to the sea you've never been to any shore you've never actually seen any of these places but by reading you know where they are and you wrote everything and they gave you distinction then about history can you tell about when fishing started you know in the world and you have read about it four thousand years ago this one happened and in asia and in parts of uh, africa because of the things they dug up they have realized that fishing started in such and such a place and in the history of fishing although you have not fished you have not gone there yourself but you also got distinction 
And then you now come to another kind of study about marketing of the fish. Now, and where they sell the most uh, fish, how much money comes in through fish, and this and that. Again, you take your exam in that, and you got distinction. In all the various branches of fishing and everything, you've gone to college, you've got distinction. And now, after that, they say, practical. You don't know how to swim. You have never gone inside the river. You have never gone inside the boat to manage or to row the thing yourself. You have never cast hook or net into the, into the river. They say, no, you are, you are a distinctive man. You have distinction in the history of fishing, the geography of the seas and the oceans, and how deep they are, and the kind of water, the chemistry and the science of the salt water, and the dead sea and the fresh water. You have got distinction in everything. Now, since you are a man of distinction, now come and put it into practice. And then the village person who has never gone to college or seminary of fishing, he has been doing it from birth. When he was born in the fishing community, they threw him into the water. They picked him up again. They threw him into the water. And from an early childhood, he has been swimming. He has been recognizing where crocodiles are and will know how to dodge them. Now, they put you, uh, you know, beside the person. He didn't go to college, but he had all his life in the fishing business. They say, you have degree. You have distinction. Get there and compete with him. The crocodiles might eat you up before you know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Theology is not enough. I've gone to a seminary. To the village chief and get land. How do we get uh, some people and make the foundation of the church? How do we deal with people if people are deep, difficult in the church? How do we manage them? How do we raise the funds to help in the work of the church? You do not know any practical thing, but your head is heavy. And your mind is heavy. You have ideas, you have studied history of the church, you have studied the medieval age, you have studied the middle age, you have studied, you know, eschatology and everything. And we say, okay, that's enough now. You've got certificate. Come and fish. And the man does not know what to do. It is not only acquired skill. We need the practical work. And I pray that God will expose us to something practical in this conference that will be able to do the work successfully in the name of the Lord. Point two is faith. You see, when the Lord Jesus Christ told Peter, cast your nets here and launch into the deep, Peter said, we have toiled all the night and we caught nothing. But then he said, nevertheless, at thy word. That's faith. Peter could have said, I'm a skilled fisherman. All the experience you have, naturally speaking, is about carpentry in uh, Nazareth, where Joseph was doing carpentry job. This is my area. I know there are no fish around this area. And therefore, for you to tell me to throw my net there, no, I'm packing up. You know why some ministers pack up? Because of the lack of faith. They said, I failed in this place. Nobody can build any church. In this area, nobody can win any converts. In this place, the fish, they, they recognize the net and they are running away from the net. They will never respond. They will never yield. But Jesus is saying, don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't pack your net and go back home. Don't say, I'm not in the ministry anymore. You are in the ministry. God knows your record. He knows your name. He knows that you are one of the people that he will use in these last days to bring a lot of fish into the boat in Jesus' name. But have faith in God. Have faith in God. You can confess to the Lord, all the night we have toiled and we have caught nothing. But then at thy word, I will obey. We will obey the Lord. And after you leave this conference, those same nets, the same nets, that you have used before and you didn't catch anything that same net in response to the word of jesus you'll get that net back to your sea and you will catch a lot of fish in the name of the lord and the same boat you have been using before the same denomination where you were before and you say this denomination i don't think that this denomination will ever get off ground it will get off ground the lord will do his work through you and through the other people that are associated with you don't get discouraged. Do not give up. The same sport, the same ship, 
the same needs, the same skill, but not the difference. Christ got into it, and Christ got involved. You see, whatever we have that has not been giving us a successful ministry before, when Christ gets involved with that thing, we shall succeed. Faith is this, at thy word, I will. I will not think about what I feel. I will not think about my discouragement. I will not say, well, I, I've even told my wife that I'm packing up because, uh, you know, this work is difficult. All the people will try to win. None of them is winnable. None of them will come. I've told my wife, and I've even told the church, I've told them bye-bye. I'm going to because I have another kind of profession I can do. I will go and do another thing. Well, but Jesus is not telling you. Even though you have told people you are giving up and you are going away from the ministry, the Lord is telling you, bring out your nets, throw your nets here. What are you going to do? Are you going to believe your mind more than Christ? Are you going to keep to your words that you are giving up rather than keeping to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? Let us believe God. Better days are ahead of us. Those of us who have failed in the past, we shall seek succeed in Jesus' name. Here we now come to their faithfulness. Faithfulness. On the one hand, they were faithful. On the other hand, they were a little bit unfaithful. Now follow me. Look at Luke chapter Five again from verse 4 when he had left speaking he said unto Simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught nets in the plural nets in the plural you see Jesus told them he said do you know Peter there is a lot of fish over here that you need more than one net all the nets you've got, unpack them, untie them, bring them out of the sheep, and then begin to fish. Because there's a lot for you to catch here. Let down your nets in the plural for a drought. Of course, he said, we've toiled all the night and taken nothing. But nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down in verse 5. The last word in verse 5. What's that word? Is it plural or singular? singular the man didn't fully understand the lord he met the lord he heard the lord and jesus said let down all the nets but because of discouragement because even though he was believing god but he didn't really believe fully that all the fish here he, he felt that well all the fish here will not even occupy a single net and therefore he, he said i will let down the net and when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish that their net break. Disobedience will cause damage to your net. You see, if they had thrown everything, then they would have been able to get all these fish in the various nets that they had. What are these nets? Well, there are many... Uh, strategies and there are many methods that the church will use there is a kind of net that will get the children to know the lord throw it down a kind of net that will get educated people launch out into the deep and throw that net down there is a kind of net that will get uh, you know highly placed people the people that are you know very logical and the people that are you know above there in the ivory tower there's a kind of net that will catch them throw it down all the nets you have and you say we don't have any nets oh yes you have there are a lot of people in the church who are members of your church they have some of them have the nets that will catch the young people so make announcement and say all of you that god has given nets in your hand in our church here your net that will catch young people and you are folding your hand and you are closing your mouth and you are not doing anything tomorrow i want to have you bring all your nets here some of you people that are highly placed here in the church where are you they raise up their hands how about the net in your hand your special net that will be able to catch people like yourself 
when you are coming to the church next time, bring your net out. And then all you people, you women here, that you need out to influence your husband, that whenever your husband says, I will not do that thing, I will not do that thing, and then I will not give cover again to buying that kind of food, and you say things like, dear now, go and manage. You women that know how to talk to your husband and change his mind and turn him around, and everything he said he will not do before then he starts doing it. You women that know how to, you know, in the market with all these uh, market, other market women, you know how to sell. Somebody wants to, uh, you know, buy, uh, you know, maybe gari or beans or rice, and when he comes to you, uh, she says, ah, the thing is too dear, I cannot buy. And you women, you know how to tie them down with your word, and you will talk this way and talk this way, and uh, you know, after you have talked, the fellow will say, okay, I will come uh, again next time, maybe when the market is better, and then you women, you will talk again and talk again, and the fellow will say, okay, I will buy just one container now, then you will talk until the person will buy ten containers. You have net. All these women in your church, they have nets. They can throw into the sea. But all these nets were keeping them. And the only net we're using is the only one that the pastor has. The pulpit net. All the other nets are hidden. And that is why we have damage on the pastor. Because the net is too small to contain what the Lord will do. If you do not want to have the net broken, throw in all the nets into the sea. And then we'll be able to catch a lot of fish. And then, you see, in this faithfulness, whenever we, are, we say we are obeying the Lord, obey him fully. If he's calling for all the nets, make all the nets available. And do not go through on your mind or your sense knowledge. Make sure that we're obeying the Lord completely. And then I said, number four is fishing. And then when they threw in, they caught a multitude. When their nets break, then they beckon unto their partners. This is cooperation or partnership in fishing, in evangelism. You know why we fight over uh, membership? We say, no, I'm walking here. I don't want, uh, you know, so-and-so to come. It's because our church building is not full. If Christ gets involved with us in the work, and we throw in the net, and as we're throwing in the net, the people are so many that we cannot even, uh, you know, accommodate. The church is overflowing. We'll be able to say, I think we need another person in this church that has pastoral ministry or the teaching gift. Let him take, uh, you know, some of these people and let him uh, have another branch in that place. Or we call a neighboring pastor and we'll say, we're not able to take care of all these people. Therefore, we need you to please come and, uh, and arrange with us, cooperate with us so that you can take care of the overflow. You see, when there are a lot of fish, they didn't quarrel. I'm sure if there were just uh, one fish that they caught, they will be, you know, arguing about, uh, you know, I'm the one that first of all, uh, beckon because, you know, that, that fish ate my bait first. And after eating my bait, then the fish went away. And now when you threw your own that has no bait at all, then the fish came and you caught, it's my fish that you are, you are catching. That fish, I must take it home back to my wife. And the other fellow will say, but you know, you don't know the fish that ate your hook. This one is my own fish. It's because there are no converts, that's why we are fighting. When the churches are full and overflowing, there will be no fighting. When I am saying, how can I accommodate all these members? And you say, my brother is the same problem I have. I don't know what I will do. All these people, I just threw one net inside. And then a lot of people came. How am I going to accommodate them? When we have problem on how we are going to accommodate all the members that are coming to the church, you will find that there will be no fighting anymore. You see, even dogs, when there is only one bone, They'll be, you know, backing and dragging and all that single bone. They'll be chasing around one another. But when you have killed, you know, at the bushes a corner, you have, a, you know, a lot of bones that are fresh, that all these dogs, they'll, not, they'll be busy with the bones. They'll not fight one another again. I think the way to solve our problem is to pray that God will send a lot of fish to the nets. When a lot of fish have come into the nets, fighting and argument and quarreling and all these other things and accusation, everything will stop and it's going to begin to happen. 
that your net will be full, my net will be full, will be overflowing. Then we'll be able to call upon one another and say, how did you handle your overflow crowd? How did you handle your overflow crowd? When we're talking about overflow crowd, there will be no uh, quarreling and fighting anymore. Then you will see over here that they had fruit. Now they put in this sheep and this sheep, and they were able to carry back home. But you see, something we need to learn is that when Christ comes into the business with you, you will accomplish more than everything you try to accomplish all through the night without Christ. At this conference, let's go to Christ again. Let's bring him into the ministry. And let us say, Lord, with all our skill, with all our certificate, with everything we have, we do not know enough, we want to know Christ more. When Christ becomes involved with us, in every area of the work we do, we shall bear fruit. And I pray we shall really bear fruit. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and tell him, O oh Lord, we've learned about fishing. Help us to apply these things in a practical way in our various ministries so that we'll have a lot of fish in our nets and in our boats. You will catch fish. Don't go without Christ. Be a partner with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been fishing alone, call in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do it alone. At the word of God, at the word of Christ, our churches will be filled. You will have converts. Let's obey the Lord to the letter. The Lord is trusting you that you will do it. You will make it. At thy word. At thy word. Go out fishing at the word of Jesus Christ. Don't do it alone. Let him come into your life and ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. O oh Lord, with the, same, with the same net, with the same method. O oh Lord, with the same word, oh Lord, with the same thing, instrument we had, we are going away renewed. We are going away with the Lord Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, at the same spot, in the same community. We shall live, O oh Lord, to cut at your word hundreds and thousands of souls for you in Jesus' name. And our church shall be filled up. And your name shall be glorified in Jesus' name. Our nets, our ministry, the ministry for the children, those for the students, those for the adults, O oh Lord, our various ministry shall be, shall be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Shall throw all of them into the, into the sea, into this ocean of men, and so shall be drawn to you in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, our churches, all our branches shall be filled with souls in Jesus' name. And your name shall be glorified. I know you have answered our prayers. In Jesus' name we have prayed.